on the atheistic view, there's nothing really wrong with your raping someone. Thus, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. But the problem is that objective values do exist, and deep down I think we all know it. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. Actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just uh, socially unacceptable behavior, they're moral abominations. Roos himself admits the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Some things, at least, are really wrong. Similarly, love, equality, and self-sacrifice are really good. Hence, I think we all know that objective values do exist, but then it follows logically and inescapably that therefore God exists. Number five, the historical facts concerning the life death and resurrection of Jesus. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come. And as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people would probably think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just accept by faith or not. But there are actually three established facts recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, on the Sunday following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, uh, an Austrian specialist in the study of the resurrection, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups of people saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent New Testament critic of Vanderbilt University, Gerald Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by skeptics, unbelievers, and even enemies. Fact number three. The original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite having every predisposition to the contrary. Jews had no belief in a dying, much less rising, Messiah. And Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead, that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. N.T. Wright, an eminent British scholar, concludes, that is why, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, like the disciples stole the body, or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts. Therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. And thus, we have a good inductive argument for the existence of God based on the resurrection of Jesus. There are three established facts about Jesus, his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. Two, the hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, is the best explanation of these facts. Three, that hypothesis entails that God exists. Four, therefore, God exists. Finally, number six, you can experience God personally. 
This isn't really an argument for God's existence. Rather, it's the claim that you can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments, simply by immediately experiencing him. This was the way people in the Bible knew God. As Professor John Hick explains, God was known to them as a dynamic will interacting with their own wills, a sheer given reality, as inescapably to be reckoned with as destructive storm and life-giving sunshine. To them, God was not an idea adopted by the mind, but an experienced reality which gave significance to their lives. Now, if this is the case, then there's a danger that arguments for God could actually distract your attention from God himself. If you're sincerely seeking God, then God will make his existence evident to you. The Bible promises, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so concentrate on the arguments that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our own hearts. For those who listen, God becomes an immediate reality in their lives. In conclusion, then, we've seen six reasons to think that God exists. If Dr. Stenger wants us to believe atheism instead, then he must first tear down all six of the reasons that I presented and in their place erect a case of his own to show that atheism is true. Unless and until he does that, I think that belief in God is the more plausible worldview. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. We will now turn to Dr. Stenger for his 20-minute opening statement. Okay. Well, aloha. It's certainly wonderful to be back in Hawaii, where Phyllis and I spent so many happy years. Our children were both born in Hawaii, both graduated here from the University of Hawaii, and it's certainly great to be back. In fact, it's almost exactly 40 years to the day that we first landed in Hawaii, and this is the first time we've actually visited Hawaii <laughs> in all that time. And uh, so we're here as tourists, and now I can see why, why so many people keep coming back to visit Hawaii. So I'd like to express uh, thanks to Alihi and the other organizers and the sponsors of this debate for inviting me. It's certainly an honor to share the, plat uh, the platform with William Lane Craig. I read that he's one of the world's most foremost Christian apologists, and he, he's given ample evidence for that today. Now, in his opening remarks, Dr. Craig has appealed to your, uh, your common sense. Well, you know what common sense is. Common sense is a human faculty which tells us that the earth is flat. Uh, on the other hand, Objective observation tells us that the Earth is round. In, in tonight's debate, I will argue that objective observation, as well as reason and logic, lead to the conclusion that a God with the traditional attributes of the Christian God does not exist beyond a shadow of a doubt. I will give four arguments to support my position. Number one, the attributes of the Christian God are self-contradictory. They're like a square circle. Number two, the attributes of the Christian God are self are, are self inconsistent with what we know about the world. Number three, supernatural explanations for events in the universe are unnecessary. Natural explanations are simpler, are based on objective observations, and are fully consistent with all we know about the world. Number four, the attributes of the Christian God imply actions that should be objectively observable, but they are not. God has not been detected. Let me list a set of attributes that are traditionally associated 
with the god of the monotheistic religions, but particularly Christianity. He's the creator of the universe. He's immaterial and transcendent. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, and indeed perfect in every way. Furthermore, God is a person. He loves humans and wishes us to know him. He's forgiving and merciful. Speaks to humans, revealing truths to us that we would not otherwise know. And he answers prayers as he sees fit and performs miracles violating natural laws. Now many philosophers have argued that the traditional attributes of God are logically incompatible. Here are just a few of these. Let's consider perfect versus creative. 